fashion adventure program that leads viewers to unique shops, boutiques, markets, and designers where avant-garde fashion experiences are discovered. Today we are here in the Pearl of Africa with Bavia, the designer and co-founder of Kona. How are you today? I'm very well, Tadri. That was a fantastic introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me. Anytime. It's my pleasure. You are the head designer mm -hmm. and, as I said, the co-founder of Kona. Yes. And Kona means uh, the corner in yes. Kiswahili, Uganda, and Hindi. Yes. So the feeling was to come from a little corner in the world and take this big brand out. Yeah. And why did you settle on that particular name and all the other things you could have called it? It's the fact that most people think Uganda and they, you usually go, where's Uganda? It's like, oh, it's the country next to Kenya. So it's about being made to feel that we're from a little corner and we're like, why not just own the space of that little corner? And the fact that the particular word meant something in three languages, which are very close to me. So Hindi culture, the uh, Luganda, because we're here and Uganda is my home and Hindi because I am Indian of Indian heritage so that blending of the three things it's just something that stayed with me and I'm like okay I'm just gonna be a big brand from a little corner in the world I like that now your name Bavia am I saying that correctly Bavia yeah that actually means auspicious prosperous successful Grand. excellence yeah. That's what it means in Hindi and Sanskrit, right? It almost means grandio, like larger than life. And your sister is the other co-founder. Yes. Her name is Nimisha. Correct, Nimisha. Which means twinkling of an eye. And she's my baby sister. She's, she's a twinkle of my sister. Okay. <laughs> and you started Kona how long ago? About five and a half years ago. It started from my garage. Um, and it was just something that was born out of the fact we we're walking around and we realized we want to grow something that was inherently Afro-Indian. So just happened and when we saw the craft market were full of a lot of things from different countries and not Uganda, it made me realize that what if we're losing the skill sets? So we started looking for skill sets that we could combine from the two cultures and create some unique products and to be honest my most proud moment is when um, somebody walks into the store like this is made in Uganda? No ways. And I'm like, yeah, it is. We've actually made it in-house. So to me, that's the biggest compliment. Well, what you have is uniquely Ugandan and appropriately fused with South Asian heritage. I yeah. love the combination of the garments, like what you're wearing right now. So this particular thing is, um, again, um, I do believe that fabrics have to be based on where we live and I think cotton is the right fabric so that's why we chose the Indian fabric because India does have beautiful cotton and I love the Kitenge because the story behind the Kitenge about how it was made for Indonesia it ended up being here and the off print that was supposed to be a mistake almost became the signature style of the fabric so those little stories that are behind these fabrics make my day and I just love them and the block prints are very famous from India and these are all like uh, organic cotton or hand printed so we're also working with skilled artisans from India it's not just here so it's about growing artisanal communities wherever we can and your earrings are gorgeous. Thank you. Talk to me about your earrings and your accessories that I'm wearing today. So, um, that is probably the only product of ours that we've not been able to translate into being made 100% in Uganda. Um, because we don't have enough uh, brass workmanship. There is some in Kenya, but then that's stepping out of Uganda. So when we started thinking about are we going to do this and since we're a fusion brand, we design it. We use a lot of semi-precious stones as you've seen. These are all natural stones. They're stones like rose quartz, amethyst, uh, druzy, agate. 
So these are placed with the, um, and India is very famous for jewelry, right? Yes. So we, we, we took the technique from there, but we're using our own design. So if you see the earrings you're wearing mm -hmm. are very West African. They're very like flat brass plates, you know, like abstract. Mm -hmm. So we try to mix the two design ethos and create pieces that are produced in India, but they're designed by us. Yes. Yeah. I and they're that. brass gold plated. Now you just came up with a new uh, jewelry collection. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's the cow horn actually. Cow horn, okay. So we are doing this cow horn brass gold plated jewelry. A lot of the jewelry um, is being made out of cow horn already. Now we wanted to add the Kona angle to it and say, okay, how can we take it? So ideally I would love to start um, exporting this particular line to US, Europe, because it's made um, to the highest standards. Like we're using the same techniques like people who provide to name and Marcus. We're using producers that do that. Yes. Because, you know, every, in the first world, they ask for your production and thing. And we want to backward integrate into Uganda, creating standard products. So. But there's more significance to this new collection than meets the eye. Because yes. in this part of the world, you have a pastoralist our right. society so the cow is very very important uh, the Ankole cow is one of the most uh, iconic pieces from East Africa so slightly the names differ but the long horned cow or the Texas longhorn that kind of breed so this is actually more significant also Tadre is because it's a byproduct of the meat industry these horns were actually left at abattoirs when beef is being produced and beef is a big industry here. So we take the leftover horns and we clean them up and create jewelry from it. So it's very sustainable, zero waste, biodegradable, whatever you want to call it. So Bavia, you are really into upcycling, recycling, reusing. Explain the difference between upcycling and recycling. Okay, so just in one sentence, one of the reasons I'm really into it is because I found that fashion was one of the biggest contributors to the pollutants in the world. Okay, so and I kind of started feeling guilty to be in this line of work. I know it sounds really crazy, but I was like, am I contributing to this? So and I was like, I love doing this. It is art and art is really important. How do we make it meaningful? That's why the upcycling and recycling. Now, why the upcycling and recycling? The main difference is, um, if you don't know this, you probably could look it up. But denim is the biggest uh, pollutant of the seas. And you can now find, I have wired just did an article, micro denim fibers up to Arctic Circle. Wow. So we were like, okay, what can we do this? Now, the other thing that's commonly known here, Owino is one of the largest secondhand clothing market. But if you try to figure out how the things come here, there is no system. Bales are just packed. Mm -hmm. Things are just dumped here. Mm -hmm. What happens to the pieces they don't sell? I don't know. Exactly. Because <laughs> okay. that's what I mean. Nobody knows. Like they just end up somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And this is stuff that has been discarded from the first world. So mm -hmm. we're like, okay, you know, I want to work with denim. I don't want to buy new denim because it's already polluting the earth. Yeah. So our first project was we buy old denim, yes. we wash it. Yes. So we're recycling it in a way, but when we cut it up and we made these third products, which have embroidery, which is inspired from the Japanese and the Indian culture of Kantha, which is thread work and Sashiku, which was used by these cultures to give old pieces of torn clothing a new life. So we use this cut, the chopped up denim with Kitenge on one side. We use the stitching embroidery work all over the jacket and it's a brand new product and it probably has 10 more years in your wardrobe. Yeah. So it's not only recycled denim, but we've upcycled it into a new product. Now see, I didn't know that about denim and I love denim and I love the new jackets. The jackets, those are timeless. Like denim is not going Correct. anywhere. And the way you stitched it and you combined it with the Katenge is actually timeless. Yes. Now let's dive into this food right here. I'm very excited. This is Izumi and it's one of my the most favorite places. This is where I come to feed the soul. Okay, I've got my passion fruit and guava frozen margarita. Uh, this prawn tempura. And um, though I love sashimi, raw fish and food, I actually love their vegetarian sushi. So this has got a veg tempura inside. It's got mango with spicy mayo and sesame seeds. And the good old pork gyoza. Yeah. <laughs> that was my choice. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, um, bon appetit. Let's yeah, dig in. Yeah. Sushi is something that was not uh, easily like Yujo was one of the few other places that came up here. But uh, I really like them because they do a lot of mixed Asian food. Like they do um, some Japanese, some uh, Thai. So it's a nice blend. And I guess I am a child of fusion, right? Yes. And everything about me is fusion. Afro Indian brand food has to be fusion. Yeah. This is really good. And I would not have ordered this on my own. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. I missed that place. Oh, it's too late. It's too late. Here is to Off the Beaten Path and Kona. Thank you. It's a pleasure, guys. Thank you. So I love this Afro Asiatic fusion. Mm -hmm. You know, you're bringing your heritage with you. You're here in Uganda. You're proud to be Ugandan. But a lot of people don't know that the Indian influence in East Africa is long and it's really strong. Almost about 100, 150 years. Yes. Or even longer. Right. Hmm. So I read that in 1890, you had Punjabi Indians come to Uganda to construct the railroad that linked up between Uganda and Kenya. <clears throat> yes. And even a bit earlier, like uh, a lot of people came from Punjab and a lot of people came from Gujarat. Okay. And because both the countries were co colonized at that point, there was a lot of uh, Gujaratis that came off the coast. Mm -hmm. But Gujaratis by nature are businessmen. And Punjabis uh, are famous for being very skilled. And yeah, they came into this uh, region. And I, that's why I find Swahili so beautiful. Because Swahili is a beautiful blend of Arabic, Bantu languages, and uh, Hindi. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Yeah. So you, you actually see the influence everywhere. You see it in the people's spaces. You see it in the food. It's in the language. It's in how people express, right? And so this, the similar uh, indentured servant situation that happened here, it also happened in the Americas, particularly in the Caribbean. Yes. And we also have a history in yeah. America where Chinese were brought to particularly the western states to build the railroads and right. they stayed and they, and they started lives. And in fact, uh, the Caribbean, uh, in the Caribbean thing, there's a lot of people that went, went from Bihar. Bihar. Bihar is a part of India. Okay. And they, you know, Chutney Soccer, that culture, they speak Bhojpuri. I don't even understand Bhojpuri. It's a language okay. and the music has it. And one day I was just sitting with a friend from the Caribbean yeah. and she played it. And I'm like, that sounds very Indian. She goes, it is. I'm yeah. like, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Trinidad, Tobago, Guyana. Correct. Like those are all influenced. So we're, we're a big hodgepodge, you know, whether we know it or not. That was the very reason we started at Kona. Like, of course, we could have just made products out of Kitenge. You use skilled artisans and it was done. But then the truth is, I... I'm Indian by origin or heritage, that's true, but Uganda is my home. My kids are born here. We want to create something that, it's not like, oh, it's Indian, but it's like, wow, it's mixed, it's Indian and taking pride in it. So using the two common factors, if I may share with you that the sari is commonly worn at weddings here they also wear a lot of headgears right yeah. and you can see the influences because there is no documented history but my research has shown that even the gomesi which is considered almost the national dress here was made by a goan tailor for one of the female schools uh, back in the day and his name was gomes and that's how the name gomesi came from uh -huh. his name Gomes okay so I found that very interesting and I was like okay we're gonna own it and we're gonna say that if Rolex can have chapati which is Rolex is almost our national food let's be very clear <laughs> <It's like a laughs> national flag. right it is the national flag and I was like if Rolex can have chapati which is very Indian you can wear sari at the weddings why not own this whole um, culture of Afro Indian right and then so whether it's the fabric it can the cultures blend right. and a third culture can be born which right. can be a shared commonality 
it's really interesting to me because I've been doing research about this Afro Indian and you see it a lot um, in places like Madagascar, in the Seychelles, right? All, all along the coast, Mombasa, sure. et cetera. But then I also relate to it as well because there are so many African Americans that do have um, Native American heritage. And according to the scientists, they believe that Native Americans migrated along the Bering Strait. I don't know if they still believe that, but that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what we were taught in school. Like but the from history, Mongolia, yeah. Mongolia, China, mm -hmm. etc. So when you really think about it mm -hmm. and you dig deeper, there are many African Americans, in fact, most that are probably Afro Asiatic. And like I told you when you mentioned the Caribbean, I was just reminded of it. The, the mix, that's a true melting pot. And I think it's high time. We're very globalized. You don't, somebody doesn't have to be african or american we can be hyphenated and we can own both we shouldn't be asked to pick sides and it's there i mean identity is so fluid True. at the end of the day you know i tell people that i'm an la girl with midwestern values and so you know my identity may change depending on who i'm speaking with I'm a Bombay girl who chose to live in Uganda, but Uganda has been my most grounding experience because it's, it taught me the value of slowing down. It taught me the value of appreciating the simplicity of life. Now, I read that you, you told me you came here when you were a teenager. My parents moved here early 90s, yeah, but I was already studying in India. So my parents moved with my sister and my brother earlier. I finished like about 19 there i came here my sister and my brother went to school here what brought your parents to this part of the world destiny <laughs> or serendipity i don't know my dad was just doing some business in dubai and it just happened to land up here um just following a few deals he had made or something 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 and he fell in love with this place and he literally came back to india and uprooted our entire family and brought us here and how has life been here for you you've been here since you were 18 19, yeah. 19. Mm -hmm. And you've stayed and you've started a family. You have businesses, yeah? Uh, it's been very interesting. I have to say it's not been uh, straight up since I'm 19. I was 19. I went back for my master's. I moved to Dubai to work. Um, though I have to say this is almost my... Um, in, in Hindi, we say Karm Bhumi, the land of karma. So um, I've met my husband here, but I went back, I was studying, I had a job. Um, business is not something that uh, comes naturally to me. I was a working professional. I moved back to Uganda, worked again in the advertising industry. And then once I became a mom, I think I just wanted to be a bit more independent and um, legacy became a big thing for me. And um, truth, I don't know if Kona is big enough yet to say that, yeah, that's the business I run and, you know, that puts food on my table. But it's something I'm very passionate about. I get to work with so many women. We're a women-only organization, right? We, most of the women we hire are single income owners. So I would say that even though we train them and we give them skill sets, I have learned a lot more. I've learned to have gratitude, you know. We, we're, we're born where we are born. It, it's not our choice. But it's our choice what we choose to do about it and I feel Kona is my that project. Kona, with Kona I want to make a difference and I, I would like for it to exist whether I exist or not. So, you know, it's something that we can all be proud of and proudly Ugandan. It's interesting because I think I've always been a feminist, even as a little girl, but I've been late to the game in terms of understanding the context uh, the, the world that, of which we live in as girls and as women. Yeah. I've been very late in understanding how we experience the world and how it can be discriminatory, how it can be predatory towards women. And, you know, I've made a conscious decision to really uplift women and really empower women and sure. try to actually lead by example. Mm -hmm. So what was the defining moment for you where you said, you know what, I want this to be a woman own business. I want to empower women. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, one of the first things I picked up while I moved to Uganda is there is a very high number of single mothers. Mm. And that shocked me. There's a very high number of teenage pregnancies. And you know, like uh, you have people who come and work for you, support you, whatever. And I call, listen, it takes a village to raise a child and I have a massive village. I'm not denying it. 
I have a whole bunch of people who help me be me and let me run a business and do other projects while they help me take care of my family. It's, it's something I'm very grateful for. But when I started talking to them and I realized that I end up interacting with them, I'll ask them, so what's your story, what happened? And usually it's like somebody left somebody. But at the end of the day, where do the kids end up? With the mom. And in those stories, I didn't realize I was picking it up subconsciously. But when Kona happened, I knew and I was very clear that I want to work with people who earn an income and it goes directly to support their families. And not wait for somebody to come and support her. And um, education is something I, I took for granted till now. But it's not, it's a privilege. And so, a lot of the women I've worked with, they just didn't have the privilege. Okay, so we use this to train them, make them understand it's better to save. How do you save? So I, I wouldn't say I just teach them skill sets, but they are my little family. Like, you know, when you start really getting involved, you start, realize there are a lot of stories out there. So I wouldn't say I have a definite moment, but like you, I've always believed that I have to fight for a seat at the table. Mm. Some just get it. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a phase in my life where I thought it's okay or I was shy about it. But I think turning 40 really helped there. Mm. And I'm like, um, well, if there's no seat at the table, no problem. I'm bringing my chair because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm coming. They mm -hmm. say when you educate a woman you educate educate a nation true when you when you empower a woman when you pay a woman you're basically feeding the whole family it's very true so it's it's very important now going back to your family mm -hmm. you are the mother of two amazing babies i met them maybe once or twice mm -hmm. and they struck me as being very well mannered well mannered thank precocious, you precocious and they were so proud of their mom thank you <laughs> How old are your kids? They are 10 and 7. And you kind of hit a nerve right there. One of the reasons I do continue to work, there are days where you're like, okay, you know what, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. It's not so hard and I'm going to do it. And every time I, I hesitate to take the next step, I want my daughter to know that, you know, sometimes you're told you can have it all. Sometimes you're told, no, you can't have it all. No, you have to find a balance. No, there's never going to be a balance. To be honest, 50% of this conversation doesn't need to be had with men. Mm. It's usually had with women, mm. right? Because you can't have a family, you can't have a business, you ah, can't have it all. Got you, got you. you can be fabulous in one, but you may suffer in the other. Okay, I don't know if you can have it all. And I'm speaking to all the women out there. I don't know if you can have it all. But you know what? At least in Uganda, I have a little village that lets me have two businesses, help out with the family, whatever their projects are, because marketing is my background. I'm raising two kids. Um, I get to help these women out. I get to work with you on a school afternoon where I should be doing homework probably. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for it. Okay. And no, it's not easy. You'll always fail or have somewhere down. But I think you said a beautiful line to me before we started shooting. Acceptance yeah. is an art. It's so an if art. you accept, right now I'm in this moment with you. And I'll need to go be a mom first or a businesswoman first or uh, I don't know, whatever else I need to be. It looks good from the outside looking in. It looks like you do it well. It's crazy. But you also have a hubby and I know he's he likes being behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think I've met him once or twice. I can't recall. But one thing I did pick up on when you shine, he's very happy. He doesn't mind the fact that you are out there no. in front and you're doing your thing. No. He's more like, go do you. <laughs> Just don't involve me, all right, baby? <laughs> and as long as we don't have to splash him on the social media. And I respect that, you know, because he is who he is. And we're all, if he's allowing me to be an individual, I don't want to be his arm candy and he doesn't need to be mine. <laughs> okay. The arm candy. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I have an amazing, like I keep saying, my support system includes him as well. Um, I've never, I've been very lucky, whether it was my dad or whether it's my partner in life. Nobody ever told me I couldn't do something. Well, what I've noticed with creative women is that when they get married, they usually give up their careers, right? For a little bit, I did. Yeah, and it's like, okay, you prioritize, you prioritize your family and a little bit of you dies. Yeah. So I think it's a beautiful thing that you're continuing and you're just following your path, wherever that leads you. Sure. But I admire your hustle. 
you just finished a shoot with bloggers. You have stockists around the world. You participate in fashion shows. Um, your social media is banging. You have clients globally, and you're constantly evolving. And you came to this right after 12 years in advertising. Yeah. And you just told me that you launched B Marketing, which is amazing. I, I just want to know, like, how you said you have a village, but really, how do you do it? So I wake up every day and I decide today is going to be about whom. And then when I'm going to bed, I have to be honest, I do beat myself. It's taken me a very long time to accept that I'm not going to be good at everything. Okay, that was, that was my biggest journey. Okay. But um, I think some, a friend of mine picked it up and it's very true. I'm 100% where I am. Um, some people will think I'm loud, I'm passionate, I'm full of energy. But you call me. If I'm going to be your friend, I'm going to be your friend 100%. I don't know how to do things by halves. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit much for some people, but it works for me. <laughs> so I'm not complaining. And um, so when I show up at Kona, I'm 100% there. When I'm there with my kids, I'm 100% there. And at least when I go to bed, I know I tried my best for that day. So that, that's enough for me. And I don't think I could live with myself if I wasn't trying my best. Now, do you have a schedule a oh, daily schedule, weekly schedule? Do you have a to-do list? Do you have an assistant? How do you balance so many worlds? Um, so this is what I do. I have a diary. I divide it into three parts. Personal, uh, work, and whatever else I'm working on, like family, community, uh, business, networking, whatever. And I put it there. And when I start working on one project, like today I'm doing Kona with you, my kids... I don't believe in giving gadgets to kids. My kids don't have a phone to call me, but because they're using Google Classrooms, they have the Google online thing. I'm like, just drop me a message, whatever needs to be taken care of. If it's not life or death, I will do it when I come back home. So very organized. I try. But I would say I'm a headless chicken on 50% of the time. Now, what about your spirituality? Like, how do you center yourself? Is it nature? Is it meditation? Um, I'm born a Hindu. Uh, but I am not, um, I believe in God, but I believe in spirituality more. I don't need to go to a temple or a church or a mosque. And I, I, I grew up in a Catholic school. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I really relate to almost every, I'm married to a Sikh. So I'm pretty much world religion happening at home, okay? Um, I do have a Bible and a rosary somewhere. I can still say my Hail Marys, don't get me wrong. Um, the nuns taught us right. And um, I can go to the Gurdwara and pray with, my husband and we got married in Gurdwara but I was also raised with the Hindu values but there I'll give full credit to my parents they said it doesn't matter which religion or what faith you practice just respect all yes. yeah because it's just one God by different names or maybe not God and the universe whatever you want to call him but as long as you have faith it helps and mine includes um, I journal okay. I forgive myself because um, I realize I can be very harsh when you're trying to do so many things you tend to fail a lot and um, you just say that okay I failed today but tomorrow is a new day and we can start again perfectionist you're a perfectionist I'm not hot but <laughs> I just want to make sure that I'm not dropping a ball I don't care if I juggle really well I just don't want to drop it completely because every aspect of my life is important whether it's my family whether it's my work or whether it's the job that pays the bills right. I gotta do it Thank you for joining us on this episode of Off the Beat Path. Tune in next week as we continue our journey in the land of seven hills.